Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Happy Easter. It's great to see everybody. Those of you who might be visiting with us this morning, especially glad to see you guys. Uh, just a note for, I guess, our greeters. It looks like uh, the, uh, the upstairs is still open. So if there's uh, anybody else coming in later, whatever, you can send them upstairs. Um, it looks like there's plenty of room up there. But it's great to see everybody. It's good for me. I'm glad to be back. And uh, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper together this morning. So anyone who's made, if you've made a public profession of faith in a Bible-believing church, you're invited, encouraged to join us at the table this morning. And just a reminder, of course, we do have to wear our mask on the entire time uh, that we're in the building. Uh, and uh, we do that out of just courtesy for one another. And, uh, of course, have to keep our, our, our distance. But we'll hang in there. We'll get through that. Uh, if you do want to hang around after the service a little bit, we'd encourage you to head out uh, through the fellowship hall onto the, onto the patio and then out onto the church lawn. And we're looking forward to, hopefully, a little, a little nicer weather in weeks to come. We were hoping today would be a sunny day. It didn't work out quite that way. But uh, anyway, if you do want to hang around, we do ask you to, to, to head out through the fellowship hall onto the patio and out on the lawn because we're going to have to get things ready, obviously, for the, for the next service. But um, so happy to be back and glad to see everybody this morning and, and trust uh, the Lord's blessing on us. Uh, don't forget, uh, tonight is our uh, joint shepherding group. I know many of you probably have plans with family, and that, that's certainly understandable. But if you're able to come out uh, at 6 o'clock, we're going to uh, have a, a, a hymn sing. We'll be singing some of our favorite your favorite uh, Easter hymns, and we'll also be watching a, a brief video by R.C. Sproul on the, on the holiness of God, and we'll be dis discussing that. So we're looking forward to kind of a, probably a smaller but intimate uh, time of sort of informal worship and fellowship tonight. We, you, we'd love to have you. I think it's going to be a special night tonight. Elder Fenton will be uh, leading that. And then some wonderful news, some good news. Tim and Geneva have welcomed their first foster child into their home. He's a little baby boy, newborn, he's a preemie, and so obviously there'll be some adjustments there with them, but so keep them in your prayers, but we're super excited for them, and if you want to help out with, uh, with dropping off a meal, speak to Sandy Fenton, there's a little, actually a website you can go to, and you can see what, what, what nights people have already signed up for, but uh, we just want to keep them in prayer, we're excited about that, and a great way we can maybe help them out a little bit. All right, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you if you would, let's rise, and if you'll have your bulletin in front of you, our call to worship this morning of course, is a responsive call to worship as we uh, remind each other and encourage each other that, that Christ is risen. So let's, let's read and hear God's word as we're called to worship together. Now I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. We know that the Christ For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. If you will, turn with me in your hymnal to hymn number 286. Hymn number 286, and I know we're... You guys are wearing masks, you just have to make a special effort. We want to encourage each, each other this morning uh, to, to worship Christ. We'll, we'll begin with hymn 286, Worship Christ, the Risen King.
Let's pray together. Father in heaven, blessed Lord Jesus Christ and spirit of the living God poured forth upon your people. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we gather this morning to worship you in reverence and awe with great joy. For you have overcome. Uh, the Christ is risen uh, victorious. And we come this morning as your people uh, summoned into this place to worship you, to glory in you, to praise you. Lord, who do we have to fear? There's none but Christ risen, Christ exalted, Christ in glory. We bless you. We praise you. You have triumphed over our guilt, our sin, our problems, this world and the grave. And we bless you. You are our hope. You are our risen Savior. You are the one we worship. Lord, we bless you and we praise you. Receive our worship this morning. Lift our hearts on high. For we come this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please. Uh, remain standing and turn with me uh, now in your hymnal to hymn 273. Hymn number 273 and we'll sing together, uh, Jesus Christ is risen today.
Father in heaven, great, eternal, and everlasting God, we bring before you our gifts this morning. We give you our, our lives, our talents, our skills, our hopes, our dreams, our, our all. Lord, take us and, and receive us and, 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 and make us yours. Consecrate us, Lord, to your, to your service. Give us hearts that love you more and, and more. May our, our homes and our families uh, increasingly be consecrated to you. Help us, Lord, to, to live lives that are pleasing in your sight. Uh, make our hearts happy and, and glad in the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we rejoice with, with Tim and Geneva and, and pray your greatest blessings upon them. We pray for all uh, the families represented here, for, for the children and for those of all ages and all the generations. We're so blessed, Lord, to have one another. And may your grace and blessing rest upon us. We ask you to come and, and meet with us. Uh, through the preaching of your word and, and come and fellowship with us uh, at the table this morning and that we might know, that we might know that we have met with God. We pray, O oh Lord, we plead, not upon our merits, but upon the merits of our Savior, upon his perfect righteousness, his perfect redemption, Lord. For Christ's sake, Lord, we pray, we, we plead, we ask, we seek your blessing and favor. Lord, we do come in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you now, if you would, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Psalms. Uh, Psalm uh, 14, uh, verses 1 to 7. Now, uh, Lord willing, next week we're going to begin a new series in the book of uh, Revelation. I'm looking forward to that. I, I hope you are as well. I, I trust it'll be a real uh, blessing to us. And if you have family or friends or you know folks who might be in need of a, of a, of a church home, I want to encourage you to, to consider inviting them to join us uh, next week. I think it'll be a natural jumping in point for people. We're starting a new series, new book of the Bible. Uh, we're starting at chapter one, and I think it's a natural time. Book of Revelation is a wonderful book. Uh, I, I dare say it's one of my favorite books of the Bible, if you can have a, a favorite. It's a marvelous book. A lot of people don't understand the book of Revelation. Uh, sometimes uh, we find it perplexing. Sometimes we even uh, avoid it as, as too difficult. But it's really a wonderful book of the Bible, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And, and again, I, I think next week would be a natural jumping in place for, for new folks um, not only because we're beginning a new series, but, but next week, Lord willing, we'll take some time to really introduce uh, kind of uh, the book of Revelation and what our approach is going to be. So, again, if you know folks, you have friend, co-workers or someone who just is in need of a church home, I would encourage you to invite them to join us uh, next week online or uh, even better in person. Uh, if they can. But for this morning, we're in, still in the book of Psalms. We're working through the Psalms under the heading, um, Life's Journey Through the Psalms. Last, last time, uh, we looked at Psalm 13, and, and we talked about what we call the long wait. If you remember that, uh, we talked about the fact that much of the Christian life, you feel like you're waiting, waiting for things to get better, waiting for things to turn around, wait, waiting for the pandemic to go away. So much of the Christian life is just, it's just, it's just waiting, waiting for answers to prayer, waiting for, for relief, waiting to, to feel better. So last time we looked at Psalm 13 under that heading, the long wait. Well, uh, this morning, uh, we're going to consider together the reason that we wait, the reason we wait. Again, our text this morning is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 14, uh, beginning with verse 1. Let's hear God's word. To the choir master of David, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There's none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to, to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They've all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There's none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. The reading of God's word. May the Lord add his blessing to it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do look to you. Your word, your truth, and your spirit. To, to, to bless these truths to us and to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
the events of the past year or so have been uh, unusually difficult, particularly difficult for a lot of people. I think that's obvious. A lot of people have found the events of the past 12 or 13 months to be uh, unusually trying and, 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 and challenging. I, again, I think that's self-evident that it's, it's been a, a difficult year. And yet every time I mention that, inevitably, at least one or two people will, will say to me, I don't think it's that bad. I don't mind working from home. In fact, it's been kind of nice. And so I want to be clear that I don't mean to imply that the past 12 months have been really unusually difficult for everybody. I mean, praise God, that hasn't been true for many of you. You've been able to go about your business as usual. Maybe it's even been a particularly good year for some of you. Praise God for that. I don't mean to imply that the past 12 months or so have been universally difficult for every single person. Now, that's not true. But if we're honest, we've got to admit that it has been unusually difficult for a, a lot of people, a lot of people have found the past 12 months or so to be particularly uh, trying, to be particularly uh, uh, challenging. Um, the word depression might be a little too strong, but if, if not depression, certainly something like that that a lot of people have been struggling with, not only in our, in our church family, but also uh, statistics show us in our country, an unusual number of people have been really struggling with something like depression. Part of it is probably just not being able to get out of the house, not being able to be active. Uh, some of it is just constantly being bombarded with bad news, you know, as we're glued to the, to the news. Uh, uh, some of it has to do maybe with them. Um, you know, the, all the things happening politically and culturally in our country. Uh, for a lot of folks, there's anxiety about getting sick or getting someone else sick or, or just the challenges of trying to take care of your kids or your family uh, during this unusual time or trying to take care of elderly parents. And, um, and, and many of us have lost loved ones. Maybe it has nothing to do with the virus, but for many people, it has been an, an unusually uh, difficult 12 months or so. And so when some people say, I don't think it's a big deal and it's all been blown out of proportion, I get it. I, I understand that. I understand that for many people it hasn't, hasn't been a, a, a particularly difficult time. But just understand that for those for whom it has been unusually difficult, uh, when some people say it's not a big deal, it just makes it actually that much more difficult uh, for those who have been struggling. And I guess the point is just that people on all sides, you know, whatever your view is about masks or politics or vaccines or whatever, I think people on all sides have not exactly been at their best. And I don't just mean here, but I mean just in the world. You watch the news. Uh, the, the, the pandemic has not exactly brought out the best in people. I think the truth is, as we'll see this morning, that the sinfulness of the world in which we live, uh, on, on all sides, um, uh, is and can be just astounding. Uh, look with me at our, at our text. Uh, David uh, begins in verse 1 by speaking of the fool. And understand that when David talks about the fool, or any times the Bible talks about the fool, it's talking about someone who consistently makes bad decisions. Okay? So there's no reference here to someone's natural intellect or their, or their education. You could have a PhD. You could have a brilliant mind. Uh, you could be uh, filled with all sorts of trivia and, and facts. You could be, still, still be a fool. Uh, that has no reference to your natural intellect or your, uh, your education. Uh, rather, uh, being a fool is a, it's a moral deficiency. It's a destructive self-centeredness. It's a spiritual problem. Uh, we can say that a fool is someone who consistently makes bad or foolish decisions because he or she doesn't believe and trust in the Lord. This is what David says. The fool says in his heart, uh, there is no God. Now, in our culture today, when we think of an atheist, we, we typically think of someone like uh, Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens. We think of a, a high-profile, well-respected uh, scientist or theorist, someone who propounds and promotes the theory that God doesn't exist. When we think of an atheist, we think of someone who publicly promotes the theory that God doesn't exist. Well, just understand and keep in mind, in David's day, uh, people like that didn't really exist. Uh, certainly not in, in, in the Middle East, in the ancient world. You did, people weren't atheists. They were, if anything, they were polytheists. They believed in lots of gods. Life in the ancient uh, Middle East was very, very religious. And, and religion was related and entangled into every single aspect of life. So you, you didn't have people who were atheists in the way we think of it today in terms of publicly promoting the theory that God doesn't exist. What David is describing this morning is what we might call a practical atheist. That is, he might be a very religious person. But David says, he says in his heart, there is no God. In other words, a, a fool could be very religious, but in practice, he thinks he can make his day-to-day -day decisions 
without being accountable to God. One scholar translates it, the fool says in his heart, God is not here. And that at least captures kind of the sentiment there. It's not, it's not a theory that God doesn't exist, but it's the idea that a person, uh, a fool is a person who, who makes daily decisions without regard to God, without regard to having to be accountable uh, to God. We can say a fool is someone who consistently makes bad or foolish decisions because he doesn't believe in, and, and trust in the Lord. Uh, David says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There's none who does good. We could say that a lack of saving faith leads to all kinds of ungodly uh, behavior. If, if you don't think you have to answer to God, on a daily basis, in practice, and you don't trust God, you don't think you can trust God, he's not going to take care of you, then inevitably you're going to act out of fear or greed or selfishness or, or anger or, or something else is going to motivate you. Uh, a lack of saving faith is going to lead to all kinds of ungodly behavior. And that's what David is saying here. They, that is the fool, the fools are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. They do things that are abominable in the sight of God. There's none who does good. In other words, there's no such thing as a good fool. That's what David is saying. There's no such thing as a, a good fool. Um, uh, sin is not something that just sort of you, you happen to do some time as some aberrant exception. It, we, we sin because we're sinners. It's, it's, it's because of who we are. And if this sounds kind of harsh, keep in mind that David was king. David was the king at the time he wrote this. We don't, I'm not going to have to take the time to show you why, but David was the king at the time when he wrote this, and so he's in a position to, to know what, what we're really like, uh, to know that um, politics brings out the worst in people. I mean, I mean, don't we see that? We see it on the news all the time. You, you know, I can't help but think that a lot of the people involved in politics, if their life had gone a different direction and you were to meet them, Maybe they would come across as perfectly normal people. But there's something about the world of politics that, that brings out the worst of people. David, of course, grows up as a, as a shepherd boy. He's, he's, he, he lives his young life out in the field. And now he's thrust into the, the world of politics as the king. Every single interaction he has inevitably has a, a political tinge to it. Uh, when you have that kind of power as king, people are going to want to get you on their side. They're going to want to flatter you. They're going to want to say what they think you, you want them to say. They're going to try to manipulate you or, or use you or, or oppose you or overthrow you. And so as king, David is thrust in the world of politics and he sees what people are really like. Um, if you've ever... Uh, you ever remember when you're a kid, you're playing in a swimming pool and you've got a beach ball and you're trying to hold it underwater and inevitably it pops up, you know. And that's kind of what the sinful nature is like. We can put on our best behavior and, and, and we can try to be good, but inevitably it comes out, who we really are. It comes out and especially in the world of politics where there's so much power, there, there's so much money, there's so much reputation, there's so much career at stake, these pressures, inevitably the, the sinful nature, it, it, it comes out. And politics uh, brings out the worst in people. Uh, David says in verse 2, the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. Now, it's, it's possible when David talks about the fool that he's thinking of, of, of people within the nation of Israel, because there could be certainly Jewish people who are foolish. You, you think of a man like Nabal or Nabal. His name means fool. If you remember David's interaction with, with Nabal, he was a Jewish man who was, who was selfish and foolish and greedy. Uh, but likely in our psalm, David is thinking of those people out there, those people of the, of the world. If you remember, uh, ancient Israel was about the size of the state of New Jersey. So... As king, David often had interactions with people from the other side of the border. So he's likely thinking of the Philistines, the Moabites, the Midianites. And, and, and that's confirmed this morning when he says, the, the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man. The children of man is that broad expression. It doesn't just refer to Israelites, but all the people out there. To see if there are any who understand who seek after God. And David says, they've all turned aside. The, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Midianites, all the different people on all different sides, they've all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There's none who does good, not even one. David is marveling at, at, the, 
at the sinfulness of the world in which he lives. And um, when you see that word, well, this whole verse 2 and 3, but particularly the repetition, the use of the word corrupt, David is, is clearly making references to that, that passage in Genesis chapter 6. You remember when, when God looked out on mankind, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. You remember that? And, and that's when God sent the, sent the flood. It said man was corrupt, for man had corrupted himself. And David is deliberately using that language. He's evoking that, that whole image of when God looked out on mankind and, and, and regretted because man was so fallen. The idea that the sinfulness of the world is just, it's just astounding. Verse 4, have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. You know, don't they know any better? And I, again, he could have in mind Jewish people who are preying upon the widow and the, and the poor and the weak, the orphan, the vulnerable. But more likely, it's the, it's the Philistines, the Midianites, the Moabites, the, the people who are always encroaching on the borders and, and, and seizing lands and, and claiming, uh, you know, taking people hostage or capturing uh, women and, and children, burning down fields and annexing uh, farmland and town. Don't they know anything? They're gobbling up my people. That's what David says. Um, people sin uh, because they're sinners. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reflection of, 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 of who and what we are on, on the inside. And, and therefore, we all need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Now, I think in this passage, David is thinking primarily of those people out there. The children of man. He's looking at all the nations of the world around. And he's marveling at just how corrupt and fallen mankind is. I think David is thinking primarily of those people out there. The goyim. The Gentiles. the nation, Those people who aren't Jewish. And yet, this is the passage that, that the Apostle Paul uses in Romans chapter 3. When Paul wants to argue... That even Jewish people need Jesus. You know, I mean, that, that's one of the main points of the book of Romans is that even Jewish people, not just those bad people out there, but even, you know, the, the Jewish people need the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the passage Paul goes to. And you can see why, because David says they've all turned aside. Together they become, there's none who does good, not even one. Uh, Paul uses this to, to, to prove that we all need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. A, a Russian poet uh, once wrote, um, I don't know what's in the heart of a good man, or I'm sorry, I don't know what's in the heart of a bad man. I don't know what's in the heart of a bad man, uh, but I know what's in the heart of a good man, and it's terrible. And you're saying, even in the heart of a good man, it, it, it's terrible. Um, G.K. Chesterton was a was a well-known Christian author and, and satirist, kind of clever fellow. And in the early 1900s, the Times of London, which was the, you know, the newspaper, the publishing agent um, of the world at the time, the Times of London, London invited a, a number of famous authors to write on the subject of what's wrong with the world today. Well, that's a timely subject. Any time, I guess. What's wrong with the world today? So Times of London asked a number of authors to write on the subject, and one of them that they invited was, was G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton's response was the shortest response they received. Uh, the question is, what's wrong with the world today? And, and Chesterton wrote, uh, Dear sirs, I am. I, I, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. In other words, you can't just say the problems of the world are out there. Chesterton says, it's me too. It's, it's me too. It's, 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 we, all, we all need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his righteousness. Well, uh, we've been illustrating the Psalms from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. So last time we talked about uh, what theologians call original sin, right? That sin nature is sometimes called original sin from which actual sins proceed. You know, again, the idea we sin because we're sinners. Well, the catechism goes on to say, what does every sin deserve? Well, every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. Okay, every sin, as well as my sin nature, deserves God's wrath and curse, now, in this life, and the life to come. Well, what does God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse? How can I escape God's judgment? How can I escape his wrath and curse? Well, to escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance unto life, 
with the diligent use of all the outward means whereby Christ communicates us to us the benefits of redemption. If I want to escape God's judgment, his wrath and curse, I need faith in Jesus and I need repentance unto life. Well, what's faith in Jesus? Well, the catechism says faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered to us in the gospel. So faith in Jesus Christ is receiving and resting in Christ alone as he's offered to me in the gospel. If I want to escape God's judgment that I deserve, I need faith in Jesus Christ and I need repentance unto life. What's repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. So repentance is not just turning away from sin. It's turning to God with a, with a new commitment, a new resolve to obey him as, as God enables me. If I want to escape God's judgment, which I deserve, I, I need faith in Jesus Christ and repentance unto life. I need to receive and rest in Christ alone for my salvation. I need to turn away from sin and turn to God with every commitment and intention uh, to obey him. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the last time we looked at Psalm 13 and we talked about what we called the long wait. The, 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 the fact that so much of the Christian life we just feel like we're, we're waiting, waiting for things to turn around, waiting for things to get better. Uh, remember in Psalm 13 David says how long O Lord will you forget me forever how long will you hide your face from me how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day how long shall my enemy be exalted over me so much of the Christian life is, is longing and, 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 and waiting for answers to prayer waiting for relief waiting for things to get better well this morning now we see the reason why we wait Peter tells us in 2 Peter that God isn't slow. Um, sometimes it feels like that, that God's taking his own sweet time. Peter says, no, God isn't slow to fulfill his promise, but he's patient toward you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The, the reason why we have to wait and we have to wait and we have to wait is because God is being patient with us to give us time and opportunity to, to, to repent. God is being patient with us. He's being patient with the, with the people in our life. He's being patient with the people in this world. In Genesis, he looked out on the children of man and he, and he saw how wicked man was and he, and he was grieved and he, and he sent the flood as judgment. But now he's exercising his patience. And so the, the reason why life is so car, hard is not because God doesn't care. It's because he's so patient. In a sense, he desires all to, to repent. He's allowing time for us and the people in our lives, the people in this world, to repent. Sinfulness of the world is astounding, but the Lord is with his people. Uh, verse 5, uh, David says, There they are in great Terror. Well, he's just talked about how the fools, the wicked, are gobbling up God's people. So you would think he means that God's people are in terror, but that's not what he means. He's talking about those people out there, the Philistines, the Midianites, the Moabites. There, they're in great terror. Uh, perhaps fear of judgment. Um, he Hebrew, says, Hebrew says that everybody lives in a certain sense of fear of dying, you know, fear of the unknown. Sometimes it's a misplaced fear. Sometimes people just have a, just a general sense of anxiety. And, and dread. Many people uh, today live in fear. Um, even before the pandemic. Even before the pandemic. A lot of people just live with a general sense of, of anxiety and dis-ease. Lack of, of comfort. Um, and, and, and the pandemic has simply brought that out for a lot of people. Not that there's nothing to be concerned about. But a lot of people have lived in fear long before the pandemic. Um, you may not be aware. Maybe you are. There's another psalm that's actually almost identical to our passage this morning. Psalm 53 is almost uh, word for word identical to Psalm 14. Um, and, and you might wonder, why on earth do we have the same psalm in, in, the, in the Bible twice? Well, if you want to keep our place marked and just flip over to Psalm 53 real quickly, I'm not going to take the time uh, to, to read it. Uh, but you can just glance at it. Uh, psalm 53, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. There, you, know, you can see right away, almost word for word, the same psalm. Why do we have the same psalm in the Bible twice? Well, there's a couple of, uh, there's actually three minor differences. 
Uh, one is in the heading, Psalm 53 says, uh, to the choir master according to Mahalath, a maskil of David. And that word maskil is thought to be a musical term, uh, perhaps a tune. And so the thought is, well, maybe that's one difference, is that Psalm 53 is set to a different tune. Okay. Even today, a lot of times a vocalist, a singer, will, will take someone else's song and they'll, and they'll put it to a different, a different tune. And, and it's still the same song. Maybe they change a lyric here or there. That appear, Psalm 14, our passage this morning, appears to be a remake of Psalm 53. Okay. The same song, uh, slightly, maybe a different tune. Here's another difference. Um, Psalm 53 is, is almost identical until we get to verse 5. Verse 5 says, there they are in great terror where there is no terror. Well, that's not what Psalm 14 says. We'll go back to that in a minute. Uh, but, but the idea is that the, the Philistines, the Midianites, the Mo- they are scared even when there's nothing to be afraid of. That, that's the idea that many people live in, in, in fear. But the Lord protects us. And he keeps us from fear. It's not just that God keeps us safe. That's true. God keeps us safe, but he also protects us from our our fears. Not to say that Christians are never anxious or fearful, but if you struggle with anxiety, imagine how different your life would be if the Lord wasn't in your life. Or maybe anxiety is not your, you know, know, we all have that old nature, that sin nature that's like the beach ball uh, just sometimes your beach ball is a different color than mine. You know, maybe it's not anxiety. Maybe for you it's impatience or irritability or, or you're tempted to gossip. You say things you should You know, whatever. We all have that, that sinful nature that, that, that pops up. Um, the, the Lord keeps that from strangling our lives and destroying us. Not that we never sin, but he, he keeps, keeps, us from, keeps us from being destroyed. Keeps us from being self-destructive. Uh, in this case, for people who struggle with fear, the Lord protects us and keeps us from fear. Um, I mentioned one difference between this psalm, Psalm 53 and Psalm 14, was likely a different tune. Uh, another difference, verse 5 indicates, it's emphasizing God's judgment, judgment on the world. Okay? But if you flip back to Psalm 14, which is our passage this morning, uh, Psalm 14 uh, emphasizes rather God's salvation for his people okay psalm 14 verse 5 is a little different psalm 14 verse 5 says there they are in great terror for god is with the generation of the righteous and so a slight difference here Uh, it's emphasizing that god is with us We, we struggle with anxiety or fear or anger or frustration or whatever our particular color of our of our uh sin nature may be but the difference is the lord is is with us um, through his covenant faithfulness. Uh, verse 6 says, You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. And remember, when you see that name Lord in all capital letters, that's the covenant name of God. That's the way God revealed himself to Moses the burning bush. It's our, our way of saying in English uh, what in Hebrew is, um, well, we used to say Jehovah, but more likely Yah, Yahweh or Yahweh. It means I am or I am who I am. It's the way God revealed himself as if to say to his people, though the world is always changing, God doesn't change. I don't change. I will do as I've promised. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. We call that the covenant name of God. And it appears very often in the Psalms. Uh, so often that I wouldn't bother to mention it, except, except that it's not used in Psalm 53. Again, we've got two Psalms that are almost word for word identical. Except in Psalm 53, it doesn't ever use the covenant name of God. It uses the more general name of God, Elohim, which is describing the, sort of the majesty and the fullness of God. Seven times. Psalm 53 uses the name Elohim seven times. Yet Psalm 14, when appropriate, instead uses the name the Lord, the I am, the, the, the I am who I am, the great unchanging covenant, the faithful God who keeps his promises to his people forever, as if to emphasize that the God keeps us, he's with us, and he keeps us through his covenant faithfulness. And then finally, our passage ends with verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. Zion, of course, is Jerusalem, you know, Mount, Mount Zion. So David is longing here, he's pleading, he's praying that salvation would come out of 
Jerusalem or out of Zion. What's so special about Zion? Well, uh, the, the tabernacle was located there. The temple hadn't been built yet at this point, but the tabernacle was like a, a, a temporary a place of worship. It was a meeting place where, where man could meet with God on earth. So when David says that salvation would come out of, out of Zion, he's saying that the, the salvation would come from God. Praying for. You have to recognize that you need the Lord to save you uh, and to bless you. If you think about it, humanly speaking, David's the king. So humanly speaking, it's his job to deal with the Pharisees, to the, the, the Philistines or the Midianites and the Moabites. I mean, humanly speaking, he's the king. It's his job to go out there and lead the armies of Israel into battle and to drive the, off the enemies. And yet David is aware that he can't do it. Oh, that it would come from God. Oh, that it would come out of Zion. David is aware he can't do it. He says, when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. So he's, he's thinking, on the one hand, we need God to stop the encroachment of the Philistines or the enemies. But, but more than that, we need God to restore what we've lost. To, you know, get the families back and the family farm back and our farmland back. The idea that you have to recognize you need the Lord to save you and to bless you. You need the risen Lord to deliver you uh, and to lead you. Uh, the word uh, salvation here in the Hebrew is, of course, the word Yeshua. Um, you, you get the Old Testament name, the Hebrew name Joshua. Okay, And then in the New Testament, we get the name um, Jesus. And, and, and so uh, keeping in mind that, the, that not all psalms are written by David, but all the psalms, in a sense, are the psalms of the king. They are the psalms of the uh, anointed one. And so... Um, Behind this, you could say, and underneath it is a, this longing for salvation, is a, is a longing for the greater David, the son of David, the longing for, 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 for Jesus to come and, and, and make things right, to come and save us, to come and, 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 and bless us. We need the risen Lord uh, to deliver us uh, and, and to lead us. In our, in our call to worship this morning, uh, we read from 1 Corinthians 15, since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. In other words, since, since Adam brought us into the state of sin and misery, since he, he's brought all this trouble, since death comes through a man, then we need a man to deliver us, to make things right. Since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also uh, through a man. And, um, and then uh, Peter says, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Praise God, he says. Praise God that he's given us a new birth, a new beginning, new spiritual life, a new identity, a new hope, born into a new living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our, our psalm ends... Oh, that salvation for Israel will come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. So we have in Psalm 13 this longing. How long, O oh Lord? How long? And then Psalm 14 ends. Oh, when God saves us. Oh, when God restores us. Let the people rejoice. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. We have an exhortation and encouragement this morning to rejoice. To rejoice that Christ came into this sinful world. In Genesis, God looked out on the sin of the world and, and, and he, sent, he sent the flood, he sent judgment. But in Christ, God looked out on the world and seeing the sin of the world, Christ came into this sinful world that he might come forth from the tomb, that he might emerge victorious, that he might, he might do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, that he might, he might make atonement for us, that he might conquer his and our enemies, that he might rise in victory, that he might save us and, and, and bless us. And so David says, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. That's just what Peter is doing when he says, praise be, praise be to God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope. To the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, yeah, life's hard. And the sinfulness of the world in which we live at times can be staggering, can be astounding. But, but the Lord is with us. He is with us in our waiting. He is with us in our 
struggles and he is he is victorious. He is triumphant over the sins of the world. He is triumphant over the sins of our own heart. He's triumphant over, over death and hell. He's victorious over our struggles. And, and he is with us in, in victory. He's with us to protect us. He's with us to lead us. He's with us to care for us. And so uh, rejoice this morning. Rejoice that, that Christ willingly came into this fallen world, this broken world. That he might come forth, not just from Zion, but come forth from the tomb uh, to to save us uh, and to bless us. Let's pray together. Father Father in heaven, we do do pray this morning, uh, first of all, for ourselves. For we need your saving power. We need your pardon, your mercy, your grace. We need you to, to sanctify us and grow us and change us. We need you to help us to overcome our fears and our anxieties, our, 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 our greed, our addictions, our, our issues, our baggage, Lord. Um, we, we come asking your, your blessing that we might more and more be a people uh, victorious, a people triumphant, a, a people of, of hope, a people of, of victory, a people of, of praise. Uh, bless your word to us, Lord, and, and prepare us this morning as we, as we come to meet you at the table. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you would, please uh, rise and turn with me in your hymnal to hymn 276. We're preparing to come to the table this morning. Uh, we'll sing together hymn 276, Up from the Grave He Arose.
Amen. You may be seated. When uh, Christ our Savior instituted the Lord's Supper, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body uh, which is given for you. And of course, when we hear that, we think of this as my body, we think of his body in weakness. We think of his body uh, suffering. We think of his body uh, beaten. We, we think of his body crucified. And naturally so, because then he goes on to say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So naturally, when Christ says, this is my body, we think of his, in his body in, in, in weakness, his body in suffering, his body uh, crucified. But don't forget that that's the same body with which uh, Christ rose from the dead only three days later. Yes, transformed, transfigured, what Paul would call a, a spiritual body. But nevertheless, it was the same body with which he walked forth from the tomb. Remember, he held forth his hands and he says to Thomas, see the, the, the nail prints in my hands. Reach out and touch the wound in my side and, and do not be disbelieving, but, but believe. So that when Christ uh, holds out the bread and he says, this is my body. Yes, he means his body, which was about to go to the cross and, and suffer for our, by our behalf. But he also means his body in which he would shortly walk forth from the tomb by his own power in, in glory and victory. So that the Lord's Supper is not only a memorial and a celebration of what Christ has done for us in dying in our place and taking our punishment and our judgment for us, but it is also a, a celebration of his resurrection. Uh, final proof and evidence of his victory that, that, that his work has been accomplished for us on the cross. Uh, death is the, is the punishment of, uh, of sin. And it was necessary that Christ die in our place for us. But Jesus himself didn't deserve to die. And so as uh, evidence, of proof of that, Christ uh, rose again. Uh, death could not hold him. As we read this morning, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So, If you have not yet uh, received and rested in Christ alone for your salvation, if you haven't yet re repented, turned from sin, and turned to God with the, with the full intention and endeavor to, to obey him, the, the Lord's Supper is not yet for you. And that's fine. Far more important that you take this time to, to turn to the Lord in repentance and faith. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to come down front. All you need to do, you can do it right where you are, is turn in faith to the Lord Jesus in repentance and faith, receiving and resting in Christ alone for your salvation. Uh, but for, if you have professed saving faith in the Lord Jesus, you're a member in good standing of a Bible-believing church. If it's your earnest desire to, to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and to glorify him, the Lord's Supper is, is, is given to you not just as a memorial of his, as his death, but also as a, as a celebration of his victory, of his resurrection. And it is, uh, it's a means of grace to strengthen you, to encourage you, to remind you that, yeah, the, the world is, is, is fallen, uh, but the Lord is with you. So we come this morning uh, by faith, not looking to the elements, but by looking to Christ, uh, he whom they represent, that our faith might be strengthened, that we might go forth remembering this morning, he is risen, he is risen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we, we do need you. We need encouragement. We need strength. We, we, need, we need to keep things in perspective. We need to remember that you are, you are victorious, that you are triumphant, that you are uh, busy doing good in this world, that you have good plans for us, that you, that you love us, that you fully accept us in Christ. We, we need to be reminded of your, of your grace, that your love for us knows, bound, knows no bounds, no limits, Lord that you pour grace upon grace, that you love us and, and accept us, that you, you adopt us into your family, you take us into your kingdom, you, you adore us as, your, as the children uh, that you have purchased by your own blood. Uh, Father, we need to be reminded of your incredible, unlimited uh, goodness. And so we pray, Lord, that as we, as we come to the table this morning, as we come to your table, you would feed us with that good news that you would nurture within us your work, what you're doing in us, 
that what you're doing in us might continue to grow, that it might continue to expand, and that what you're doing in us might triumph over uh, the, the, the sin within us, the, the troubles of, and problems of this world, that in Christ we too uh, might be and are victorious. And so, Lord, minister to us, we pray. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you may have um, taken a, a prepared uh, communion packet on your way in. Um, for the rest of you, uh, the elders are going to be coming forward and are going to be serving. Um, uh, the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread. Blessed, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. As I and the elders ministering his name will now give to you. We're going to participate together. Uh, in fellowship. I've been asked to remind you that uh, uh, if you do desire to receive the elements, simply hold out your hand and, 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 the, and the elders will place them in your hand. Our Lord took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples saying, uh, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
the same way our Lord also took the cup and having blessed that, he gave it to his disciples. As I and the elders ministering his name will now give to you. And again, we'll participate together in fellowship. Our Lord took the cup and he blessed it. He gave it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink you, all of it. Pray together. Father in heaven, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And so your victory is our victory. Your triumph is our, our triumph. Your, your resurrection is our hope, our, our encouragement, our, our, our future, our, our confidence, Lord. We, we confess and, and we renounce fear, selfishness, anxiety, anger, bitterness, all the things of, of the flesh. And we bless you and we praise you and we would take upon ourselves hearts of hope and, 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 and grace and, and confidence, not in ourselves, but, but in you. 
And we, we, we bless you that you have, a, you have a hope for us. You have a future for us. You have a plan for us. We thank you, Lord, that in Christ there is grace upon, upon grace, that you love us and you, you care for us. Thank you, Lord, that you are always with us to the end, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us this sacrament is a, is a sign and a, and a, and a seal that, that nothing can sever us from you. Nothing can snatch us out of your hand. That you, you are the risen Lord, the, the triumphant Lord, the victorious Lord, and, and you are our Lord. And so, Lord, we pray, we ask that we might go forth this morning as, as your people victorious. Your, your, your people, not just in battle, but your, your, your people victorious, your people triumphant, your people uh, full of joy, your people full of hope. Uh, we rejoice this morning, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Lord, we thank you and we pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you now, if you would, turn with me uh, in your hymnal to our, our closing hymn. It's hymn number 277, and, and uh, don't miss the uh, verse 5 on the other page. We'll sing all, all five verses of 277, Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's stand, and we'll sing together.
Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace.